Once upon a time, there was a nationalistic French archaeologist, and he was obsessed with the question, where do the French people come from? And as he was excavating in Paris trying to answer this question, he asked himself, how will I recognize a French person? Well, we French people, we like to wear berets. But not all French people wear berets. A baguette, delicieux. Ah, but not all French people like the baguette. What is it? Ah, passeport. All we French, passeport, we have French passeport. And so, after much digging, he was able to determine that the origin of the French people was in 1812, which happened to be when the first French passports were issued. So, in our search for the origin of life, we're a lot like this French archaeologist. We're confounded, confused, and we're stumbling over a definition. What is life? What is a French person? Viruses. Here's a quote. Most evolutionary biologists hold that because viruses are not alive, they are unworthy of serious consideration when trying to understand evolution. I violently disagree with this. <laughs> if viruses have something to do with the origin of life, then understanding them may be the most important path we have for understanding life elsewhere. This follows from the basic principle, which is, the closer to the origin you can get, the closer to universality, and so maybe if viruses are at the origin, that's closer to universality. So familiar life emerged from some viral life or RNA world, and this emerged from chemistry and physics. So let's talk about the RNA world. Well, in 1962, Alex Rich talked about information and catalysis in one molecule. And five years later, Carl Woese started, started talking about something very similar. And then in 1986, Wally Gilbert, writing in Nature, wrote, coined the term the RNA world. And he, the RNA world contains only RNA molecules that serve to catalyze the synthesis of themselves. And then in 1982, and then they got the Nobel Prize in 89, Sidney Altman and Thomas Cech found ribozymes. These are RNA molecules that not only have information, but they have catalytic activity. So RNA that is both information and catalyst. catalyst. Now, in 1989, James, Jerry, Jerry Joyce wrote RNA Evolution and the Origins of Life. He wrote, the evolution of RNA is likely to have played an important role in the very early history of life on Earth, but it is doubtful that life began with RNA. So the most important feature of RNA is that it combines genotype and phenotype. So that's information and catalysis in a single molecule, so that replication of RNA enables Darwinian evolution to occur at the molecular level. So here's where we start, maybe, we start Darwinian evolution, when we can have RNA. Also, interestingly, it's a very important piece of, uh, that's something we think we know, and that is RNA preceded DNA. It came earlier. Now, this is because in contemporary metabolism, the biosynthetic pathway to produce DNA produces RNA first. And that, I think, is pretty good evidence that the RNA came first. Joyce wrote, also wrote, consideration of what, became, what came before RNA must take into account relative in, relevant information from geochemistry, prebiotic chemistry, and nucleic acid biochemistry. And so that's basically the physics and chemistry at the core in this diagram. Remember, how far back in time does biology go before it becomes physics and chemistry? Well, maybe back to an RNA viral world that's common to all planets. So on Earth, we have viruses and cellular life, but maybe on these other planets, maybe the quirky things they evolved into are only viruses and not cellular life, maybe. In an RNA viral world, it's a world of molecules that have had information about the environment coded into them through natural selection. But those molecules do not necessarily have to be RNA. 
They're probably some kind of polymer. Now, here's Julian Cella Flores, and he wrote, in the hierarchy of evolutionary stages leading to the origin of life, the RNA world may have been a late development. For example, earlier stages that may be cited include the Theester world of Deduve, 1991, and that image is a Theester molecule, and then the pyrophosphate world by Baltchevsky in 1990. So he's postulating that there was a pre-nucleotide world which turned and evolved into a nucleotide world. Now here's a Bamford 2005 illustration. And as you can see, there's bacteria, there are archaea, and there's eukaryotes. But in blue are the viruses. And you can see that they're at the origin, at the root there, there are lots of deeper blue. There are more and more viruses. So viruses are everywhere in the tree of life. There's not one branch of life that is not uh, overridden with viruses. And that's a good sign, or it's an interesting piece of evidence. How did they get everywhere? How did viruses get everywhere in this tree? Well, one idea is that they're intimately connected with the origin of life, and they've been adorning the tree of life since its origin. Another idea is that they were once autonomous, then they evolved into parasites, and then colonized the entire tree. I th this uh, diagram suggests that one is the correct answer. I tend to sympathize with that answer. And now, to get, to try to involve viruses in the phylogenetic tree, we need to understand the most conserved things possible. Now, we've been talking about amino acid sequence. This is a protein. When they're made, they then fold up into a 3D protein structure. Now, it seems that the structure is much more evolutionary conserved than the sequence, such that proteins with high similar structures, highly similar structures, can have entirely different sequences. The folding pattern is what's ancient and conserved, not the sequence. So the protein fold superfamilies represent the current limits on our ability to identify common ancestry. In other words, if we want to make a phylogenetic tree that includes viruses, we need to get the most conserved thing, and that's these, these folding three-dimensional structures. So let's use them to create a phylogenetic tree with viruses. So here's a paper from 2015, and these are overlapping structures. So what he did was looked at fold superfamilies, common structures, in archaea, eukaryotes, bacteria, and viruses, and here's where they overlap right here. So archaea, bacteria, eukaryotes, and viruses. And so these are common. So when we have a, a common conserved things, we can make a phylogenetic tree of these folds evolving. And when he did that, they did this, they produced this tree here. And all of these are viruses. And here's where viruses diverged. Here's where cellular life diverged from what had been only viruses. So viruses are at the root, and then cellular life is kind of like an afterthought. So here, without viruses. Now one thing here, there are some viruses that are more closely related to cellular life than other viruses. And here, the ones that are most deeply rooted. So you can cre create a, an, an order to these. Now these are megaviruses, so let's have a look at those. A meme virus and a megavirus. So these things are kind of, they can do a whole bunch of things that other viruses cannot do. They're really big, for one thing. So Mimi viruses possess genes coding for nucleotide and amino acid synthesis, which even some small obligate intracellular bacteria lack. This means that unlike these bacteria, Mimi viruses are not dependent on the host cell genome for coding the metabolic pathways for these products. Aren't they beautiful? So let's look at the, the phylogenetic tree we've been using so far is this one from HUG 2016, and that's only cellular life. There are no viruses included, but there have been some efforts to, uh, to add viruses to this tree. So let's make uh, that, the cellular life in blue. Here's, another, here's Ward 2005, which created, he kind of waved his hands a bit, and he created a phylogenetic tree with viruses. And uh, right there is cellular life. Most of it is viral. And more recently, in 2015, we have this tree with viruses. 
Here is cellular life, but as you can see, viruses to the left are closer to the root. So the idea of, of creating a phylogenetic tree that includes viruses is very controversial because, as I said, about a quarter of biologists don't even think viruses should be considered to be alive. And in 2009, there was a, an opinion piece, 10 reasons to exclude viruses from the tree of life. So 10 reasons not to make the trees on the right. But other people said, oh, no, no, no. Com there are compelling reasons why viruses are relevant for the origin of cells. And someone else wrote, viral genomes are part of the phylogenetic tree of life. But then the original author said, no, 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 yet viruses cannot be included in the tree of life. So these biologists are arguing with each other about whether you can or cannot create a phylogenetic tree of life that includes viruses. And interestingly, viruses often come out at the root or near the root. And I think that's an important, uh, very important piece of information. But the biologists can't agree, so we have a tug of war going on here that you should know about. And I also want to mention something that I call the chimp trap. Now, sometimes I've heard the question, if we evolved from chimpanzees, why do they still exist? And then somebody says, well, that's because since our divergence, they have stayed the same, but we have evolved. But this is all wrong because we did not evolve from chimpanzees. We and chimps evolved from a common ancestor who was not a chimp and was not a human. So how is that relevant for viruses? When adding viruses to the tree of life, it is important not to fall into the chimp trap. So if we ignore or are ignorant of all the ways that viruses have evolved over the past four billion years, then we are in the chimp trap because we'll be saying, We've evolved from viruses, but since our divergence from them, they have not evolved, and we have. That's the chimp trap. Now, Richard, who thinks we're all Africans, I do too, in The Ancestor's Tale, wrote, over half our DNA consists of viruses or viral-like particles that hijack the machinery of DNA replication to spread themselves about the genome. Now, I should say that 100% is also over half. So, uh, if he was, so maybe 100% of the DNA is viruses. So maybe we're the ones who have hijacked the virus's machinery of replication if we are, if we are further down, if viruses are at the root of the tree of life. And Richard writes, it is unclear how viruses are related to other life forms. And he wrote this before the uh, article I showed you in which viruses were included in the phylogenetic tree of life using proteins superfolds, folding families. Now, Richard also wrote the extended, the extended phenotype and uh, an earlier book, and maybe we are the extended phenotype of viruses. Just an idea. <laughs> but it's an idea that reminds us of uh, Richard's 1976 blockbuster book, The Selfish Gene. And the message of that book was essentially that genes use cells and bodies to protect themselves and reproduce. You can also say the same thing about viruses. They use cells and bodies to protect themselves and reproduce. And you can also say the same thing about humans. We have cells and bodies to protect themselves and reproduce. Now, so let's, let's try to think laterally here a bit. Does life mean only cellular life? Does, are, do vi are viruses without cells, are, is that life? So we can divide, think of, uh, we can think of an organism, some type of life form, and then the boundary around that organism. And I'm using the term organism loosely here. So we can think of multicellular life, and the boundaries are, we have a skin, or if you're a tree, you have bark. And if you're cellular life, you have cell walls and membranes. And then if you're, let's say, a nucleus inside of a eukaryotic cell, then you have a nuclear membrane. Then there are organelles. They have membranes. Now, viruses, they have envelopes sometimes and capsids always. So that's their boundary. So life on Earth may have originated in a viral world. And here's a picture of that that I drew. 
2006, the tree of life emerging from roots in a viral RNA world. Every branch is adorned or infected with viruses. And this was kind of motivated by Carl Woese, who in 1998, he describes an RNA world of protoorganisms in which horizontal gene transfer played the dominant role. Reproductive fidelity was low, but as fidelity gradually increased, organisms with gene lines emerged from a genetic chaos. Viruses still belong to such a genetic chaos and are therefore good candidates for being representative survivors of this epoch. In other words, viruses may have diverged so early from the forms of life that led to us that we have difficulty recognizing them as our ancestors. So, maybe on the other planets, there are viruses, but no cellular life. And suppose we discover a planet on which there are viruses, but no cellular life. Have we discovered life elsewhere? Well, a quarter of the biologists would say no, because viruses are not alive. A quarter would say yes. A quarter would say I don't know. And a quarter would say it doesn't matter. Let's get into a time machine and go back. Let's dial it for a hundred years ago and visit our ancestors. Or a thousand years. Or a million years. Even a billion years. And the more we go back, the less like us our ancestors will be. In fact, if we go even further, we won't even recognize them as our ancestors. And even further than that, we won't even consider them to be alive. This non-recognition is important for trying to understand the origin of life. For example, if life originated from a viral world and we're looking for cellular life, then we're looking for French passports. <laughs>